What's up, skeptics? Welcome to another episode of Reason to Doubt, your source for all things skeptical. I'm Jordan, and this is going to be an unusual episode. You may have heard that I'm a nuclear engineer, might have mentioned it once or twice, and talked about how cool I think nuclear power is. Well, a while back, I did an interview on the now defunct Reality Insights channel, no longer exists, but I went on there and did an interview about nuclear power. And since that video no longer exists, I thought I might repost it over here. This is purely because I want to make sure this is stored for posterity and not because I can't talk for more than 10 minutes without hacking up a lung. So sit back and enjoy me talking about my passion and buckle up because once my voice is recovered from the flu, so I can speak for extended periods of time again, we'll be jumping back in with some interviews of cosmology we have lined up, uh, one on race realism that's going to be well, I want to say fun, maybe not fun, but informative, and yet more shadow turn stuff. But until then, nuclear power. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the channel. Uh, we've got something very slightly different today than the usual semi, semi-scientific, semi-theological nonsense that I tend to put out. We have Jordan here from the Reason to Doubt podcast, who is allegedly a nuclear engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is here to talk about nuclear power because we're in the middle of a net zero craze and nuclear power, I think, is a very underrated and much maligned technology. And Jordan is here to hopefully give us some information about how it works, debunk some of the myths and just teach us all about it. So welcome. Thanks for having me. I can, I will talk about this to anyone for great lengths of time, so I hope you're ready. <laughs> Good. Well, my, my bedtime was about 15 minutes ago, so Perfect. we will see. <laughs> I, I, might, I might call in, not go to, I might just not go to work tomorrow. Right, so just to begin with, um, would you like to just introduce yourself? Well, you've been on before, but, you know, just for the sake of argument, would you like sure. to introduce yourself a bit, like your expertise on this particular topic, and just a little bit about your podcast as well? which is also a very good one. Uh, so my name is Jordan. I am a nuclear engineer. I work in the industry. I won't say what company I work for, though people, if they were determined enough, could probably figure it out. Um, I am not a representative of them in any way. I'm talking, these are all my opinions, so my company has nothing to do with it. Uh, my expertise, such as it is, I have a bachelor's degree in mechanical and nuclear engineering, and uh, I work the... F position I currently have is uh, probabilistic risk assessment, which basically we analyze the plant and all the ways it could fail and try to keep it from doing that. <laughs> With most of success, mostly? Uh, a great deal of success. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't heard of any large areas of the United States being irradiated recently. No. So Not must, recently. You must be doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> so to begin with, what is nuclear power? So my basic understanding of power sources and power stations in general from the um, thermodynamics module that I did in one semester in my first year of uni is electricity generation is done via generators, which are spun around via steam usually, and you have a way of heating the steam up. And That's... nuclear power is a way of doing that. That's my yeah. very basic understanding. That's how most power generation is done. Uh, there are exceptions. You know, you could have uh, photo photovoltaic solar, which you know doesn't spin anything. It's direct, uh, directly generated. Um, and sometimes the turbine is spun directly by the fluid. So, like uh, hydrothermal or uh, hydroelectric, rather, falling water turns a turbine. But generally, for most forms of uh, power, you have some kind of heat source. It heats up some kind of working fluid, usually water, not always. Um, and then that fluid turns a turbine, you get energy. Awesome. So how does nuclear power do that? So once you, on the one side, so there's like two sides to it. You've got the heat generation side and then the electricity generation side. On the electricity generation side, it's the same whether you're doing nuclear or coal or gas or whatever. Steam, it, there's a heat exchange uh, that sends steam or your heated fluid to the turbine, and then it goes, does its cycle. On the heat generation side, the way that nuclear power generates its heat is through nuclear fission. And so you have some kind of fissile material. Fissile just means it can fission. Uh, usually it's uranium. It could be plutonium or some other kinds of fuel, but most of the time it's uranium. And uh, when uranium splits apart, when it fissions, it spits out 
a couple neutrons. Those neutrons get absorbed by other bits of uranium, which causes them to split apart. And that's how you get the chain reaction. And in addition to spitting out neutrons, it also spits out a ton of heat. And so that's how you get it. Yeah. So just to quickly clarify terminology, fission means splitting. Yes. Uh, so yeah. when an atom fissions, it it was uranium. And then that nucleus splits apart into two different things. If there's a distribution of isotopes or atoms it can turn into. But it was one atom. Now it's two atoms with some bits flying in all directions. Yeah, and that's actually a different element then, isn't it? So yes, uranium, it stops being uranium, becomes something else completely. Right. And eventually because... it ends up as something that can't fission anymore. Right. So right? kind of fundamentally, what defines an element is how many protons it has. Because in the nucleus, you've got protons and neutrons. Uh, for instance, if something has one proton, it's hydrogen. It can have as many neutrons as you like. doesn't matter. It's still hydrogen. Um, and once it has two protons, it's helium, and so on. So the number of protons tells you what atom it is, or what element it is. The number of neutrons uh, changes some characteristics of it. We call those isotopes. So if it has a differing yeah. number of, of neutrons, that's a different isotope. When it comes to uh, radioactive materials like uranium, uh, they're unstable because of an imbalance between the number of protons and neutrons that they have in the nucleus, and they want to get to stability, and so they'll decay. They'll uh, do some spit out some kind of particle or do something that will release radiation and work them down towards stability. Often, the stable isotope they hit is lead. At the end, doesn't necessarily have to be, but that is the case for uranium. Yeah. So, yeah. And it can take multiple steps. I think I remember, I vaguely steps. remember doing a bit about. Um, when I was doing physics at A level, so when I was about 17, 18, we did um, some stuff about nuclear decay, and they, I do vaguely remember a diagram of uranium uh, decay. It yeah, went it, through a few different elements before it ended up as lead. It's called a decay chain, is what it's called. Yeah. Um, and yeah, uranium goes through, I forget how many, it's more than a dozen different steps. And each step has varying degrees of radioactivity. Some decay faster, some decay slower. Um, it just depends on yeah. the... At uh, and also, there can be more than one decay path. Like uranium, a couple ways down the line, it can split. That That's real technical stuff. doesn't really get into yeah. the power. For, so far as power is concerned, the fission happens. It spits out some stuff that then decays away to do other things. Yeah. And it's, but it's the heat that you're interested in for energy. Is that right? right. That is yeah. correct. The heat. So Ultimately, it's you're, you're transforming your thermal energy, your heat, into electrical energy at the end. Yeah, and that's what. So then, the the what you mentioned earlier, this the, the steam, the working fluid, mm -hmm. is the mechanism via which you go from one to the other. Correct. You so, put, put heat into the working fluid. We'll just I'm I'm just gonna call it water. It doesn't have to be water, but it usually is. So let's just call it water. Um, you put heat into the water to turn it into steam. So you've transferred the heat from one side, one spot to another, from the uranium, the hot rocks, into the water. Um, once it's steam, that steam can be directed to a turbine, which is a spinning thing with blades. And when you get spinning things in the magnetic field, electricity is generated. So that's where you turn your kinetic. Yeah. It gets the heat. The heat turns into kinetic energy of the turbine. That kinetic energy ultimately leads to electrical energy. Becomes electrical energy. Great. Um, there's another bit I wanted to bring up, but I'll do that a little bit. I think that'll fit in a little bit later. So that's basically what nuclear power does by mm -hmm. comparison to... So people obviously are familiar with coal-based power stations and gas-based power stations. In the UK, we have a lot of gas, actually. But basically, it's all just heat sources. Yep. That's, the, that's uh, the main difference. For a gas okay. power station, you would burn natural gas, which would then heat water, which would turn a turbine. For coal, you yep. would burn coal, which then heats water and turns a turbine. Once you get to the steam generator part, the, the generating the steam, the heating the water part, the rest of the plant's identical, in, okay. in theory, anyway. So moving on, then with nuclear power, how what's well we, we, well we can do both. So what is the what are the benefits of nuclear power? Why would you use nuclear over something like say like say a gas plant? So there's a lot of different benefits and some drawbacks because uh, there's no such thing as a perfect solution. If someone tells you that their solution has no drawbacks, they're either ignorant or lying to you. And nuclear power is no exception. So. Uh, some of the benefits include the reliability of nuclear power. So the way you measure, one of the ways you can measure reliability of a power plant is something called a capacity factor. 
Um, so if you imagine your power plant is rated to generate 1,000 watts of electrical energy. Um, so if it were hypothetically running full tilt, that's how much it would be generating. But in re reality, nothing ever runs forever. There's always going to be outages. There's going to be reasons you have to take it down for maintenance or refueling or whatever, various different reasons. And so if you take your the hypothetical amount, you, your rated power, um, and your actual power, divide the two, that ratio is your capacity factor. So the capacity factor for fossil fuels is usually around 50%. Your coal is your national gas. Mm -hmm. So if it's rated for 1,000, you'll actually get 500 or so out of it. Uh, solar is lower, about 25%, which isn't surprising since the sun is down half the day, right? So that's 50% right there. Uh, they just make these excuses to <laughs> justify why uh, they don't produce anything. Nuclear is 90 to 95%. Their capacity factor is uh, upwards of 90%. The exact number varies by plant. Um, and important to note, a lot of that downtime is a scheduled outage you know years in advance. So you can plan for it. Okay. Uh, a nuclear plant, um, each reactor refuels every once every 18 months. So And it, you can time it. So we time it in the spring or the fall because that's when demand is the lowest. So we kind of it eases the burden on the grid because we can plan our outages to have the least impact, right? All right. Well, that's that's heating in this winter and air conditioning in the summer, presumably. Exactly. Right. Or something along those lines. Yeah, that's right. interesting because a lot of the reputation the reputation of nuclear power is that it's like on the edge of exploding half the time. <laughs> no, so it's I also once, it isn't, but that's the impression that you would get from what people often believe about it. So the fact once that you it's get that it, good. Is Once you get it running, it's extremely re reliable. And it's it's one of the best sources of power you can have, short of like a battery, but that battery power has to come yeah. from somewhere, right? I mean, uh, uh, in terms of like having a baseline amount of electricity available for use, it's hard to beat nuclear power. Yeah. For that. Was that, would that be because if I'm, I'm just, I'm just thinking about it, would that be because, I mean, the, first you went to talk about capacity factor, you're talking on average. So presumably the plant, so if you say like a gas plant is typically 50%, mm -hmm. that's because sometimes it's off and mm -hmm. sometimes it's on at 100%. It's not like just running at 50 the whole time. It's that's, right. that's an average and, over a period of time. Is that right? And that would be an average, not just for the specific plant, but for those plants like globally. And there's yeah. there's some a lot of factors that go into it. Um, sometimes you don't need the plant on, right? Sometimes they're used for what's called load following, where the plant is turned off on purpose. Right, because you don't want to have too much power on the grid. And then when the power, the demand creeps up, they kick on plants. So that's one th one yeah. part of it. But another part is just maintenance um, and the availability of fuel, a lot of different factors. And it varies wildly between the different yeah. uh, generation types. One thing that's interesting in the UK is we have an entire power station in Wales. I think it's hydroelectric, but I'm not sure, which was put in to handle the extra load on the grid at the end of there's a TV program like a soap soap opera called EastEnders and every time EastEnders finished everybody would go and put their kettles on to make tea <laughs> so we have a we have a power station that can spin up in something like 30 seconds to handle the load on the grid from everybody putting their 3 kilowatt kettles on at the same time <laughs> it's interesting which I thought was interesting yeah but so, imagine the main sorry Go ahead. I was just saying, I'd imagine that the maintenance thing is like everything turbine wise is the same. But if you have a nuclear reactor, it is, you know, yeah. sort of thing. But if you have a nuclear reactor, your heat source is basically a lump of radioactive metal that's kind of sitting there. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have a coal power station, presumably you've got coal feeding and burners and all kinds of complex technology to actually get the heat out. Well, there's a whole logistical train too, like yeah. with coal. You have to bring in coal every single day to keep throwing it in the burn in in the you know in the boiler for natural gas. There's a pipeline, and you have to continually get that natural gas yeah. right. With nuclear power, you refuel once once every eighteen months, and then you don't need to do. I mean, you do yeah. maintenance and stuff, but you don't need it's to not, like bring in other stuff in order to keep it working. It's not a great quantity of fuel either, is it? Is that right? Because I, I vaguely remember years again. This was years ago. A friend of mine, when we were doing when we were doing our PhDs at university, we were just looking it up one afternoon instead of you know working. And um, I think he showed me a photo of some silos which were nuclear waste, and they were very small. Mm -hmm. Yes. So one of the advantages to nuclear power is the the energy density of your fuel is tremendous. 
uh, because you're dealing with fundamental like forces of atoms. You're tra- you're what you're doing is you're changing energy from matter to energy. That e equals mc squared. Yeah. That's that's where your energy is coming from. And there is a lot of energy <laughs> in a nucleus. So the energy density is huge. Yeah. Um. For example, uh, I have here a three D printed a uh, little pellet. This is one uranium fuel pellet and your rod would be a bunch of these stacked on each other, but you can mm-hmm. see how small that is. Uh, this fuel pellet has enough to power a home. I think the number is like somewhere around a month uh, is what you'd get out of this one pellet. And of course there'll be thousands in the reactor. Pellets, yeah. um, um, but the um... fact that it is in such a small form factor and you get so much energy out of so little, uh, it helps with not having to refuel, but it also means that the, energy source while finite is still there's enough uranium on earth to power all of humanity's needs for centuries Uh, there's plenty to go around and you you, there's other things that we could also use for fission so the fuel is plentiful and it represents a relatively small portion of your operating costs so it's not cheap to make your to make nuclear fuel however um, if you look at the overall cost of running the plant the fuel is about 15 percent uh, contrast that to natural gas, which is 76%. So if the cost of your natural gas goes up, the cost of your en- electricity is going to go up yeah. almost the same amount. A, which is a bit of a problem here because we're highly dependent on gas. Um, just right. to put that just to put that in perspective, again, when I was doing my first year thermodynamics module, the guy, the lecturer, did a lot of work with the local power station, which was a big coal-fired plant. I don't, think, I don't know if it's even open anymore because it was a long time ago. But he was explaining then that that plant at full whack was burning 800 tons of coal per hour. Mm-hmm. And versus uranium that's using a few tons per year. So this or pellet, just to compare to other power sources, a pellet this size uh, would have as much energy available to it as a ton of coal, 150 gallons of oil, or 17,000 cubic feet of gas. So you just don't need much of it to run the plant. So that's an advantage. Uh, Another big advantage is that it's clean. It produces no greenhouse gas emissions, obviously, because you're just fissioning stuff. Uh, Now, of course, there are greenhouse gas emissions for building nuclear because you have to mine the uranium. You have to build the plant, which means you're going to have to do construction, and that has greenhouse gas emissions. You have to do logistics. So like every power source generates greenhouse gases. Solar and wind are no exception. But if you look over the entire life cycle of the plant, you can compare them by uh, the gram equivalent of CO2 per kilowatt hours, the measurement that's often used. So nuclear uh, produces 12 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Compare that to 11 for onshore wind, so it's about the same. Uh, po- solar is about 50. Natural gas is 500. And coal is closer to 1,000. So um, compared to your fossil fuels, it's virtually no greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. But that's also that's just greenhouse gas. I mean, coal has a lot of other crap in it as well. Right, it gets uh, um, blasted out. Ironically, uh, you can't easily build a coal-fired boiler, like a coal-fired plant, near a nuclear plant. There, were, they briefly looked into that at a plant I'm aware of uh, as just a, they were trying to expand, and they couldn't because the there is some level of radioactivity in coal because there's some uranium in there, mm-hmm. and the amount of radioactivity from the from the um, smoke was too much. It put the nuclear plant out of specs. Like it was against regulations for the nuclear plant to have that <laughs> much radiation nearby. <laughs> oh dear! Oh dear! Oh dear! Oh dear! No, I have I have read that before. Actually, that coal taken in totality, coal power stations are often more radioactive than nuclear power stations. Yes, because obviously the concentration of uranium in coal is very low. You're just burning so much of it. Yeah, and also you're not containing that radioactivity. A yeah, lot I mean, of work, a tremendous amount of work in nuclear plants is goes towards keeping the radioactive material in the plant where it's supposed to, where it belongs. Yeah. You know? and, then, and then in coal power stations, I will just just spit it out of chimney. It, It'll be fine. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so yeah, also, also the cancer between friends. Nuclear power is one of the only industries that has to take care of itself from cradle to grave, from the second the uranium is mined all the way to the minute we put it in the ground forever we are responsible for it the whole way. Um, to contrast that to coal, where they mine it and then burn it, and then it's like it just disappeared. Now it's somebody else's problem. <laughs> it doesn't exist anymore. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's just in the air. Like Who cares? Yeah. Right, so we've done some of the benefits. How about some drawbacks? 
One more benefit that we'll get to a little bit later, I think, is safety, uh, which I think is one of the biggest things. So I don't know if we can do that now. We can do it later. But nuclear power next on my list. Okay, nuclear power is the most safe form of of energy generation. But I can delve into that. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll do it. I've actually got that as a a complete section onto it. So So, uh, drawbacks. The biggest. There are two big drawbacks. Nuclear power. The one in its current form, nuclear power as it currently exists, is ruinously expensive to build because it you've got massive plants with the entire logistical train behind them uh, the plants cost billions of dollars to build it's a tremendously high capital cost upfront cost it takes a lot of money and nobody wants to spend that kind of money up front also uh, it, and that's just the budget money often nuclear plants go over budget because they're built so rarely and when you have a massive infrastructure project and the people involved haven't done that before. There's a lot of learning that has to go on, which learning takes time and money. And But because nuclear power is done so rarely, at least in the West, every nuclear plant may as well be the first one ever built. And so, yeah. and because nobody involved has ever built one. And so they are notorious for going over budget. Now, granted, once you build it, the costs are low for until for the life of the plant. And plants, while they're licensed for 40 years, they often run 60 or even 80 years. Uh, we haven't tested past 80 years, but I know uh, the plants that I'm working on uh, have been running for 40. They got a, a license extension to go for 60, and everyone expects them to go for at least 80. Unfortunately, the way that money works, with the time value of money, when they're calculating like the capital costs, generating power in 60 years is worthless. It doesn't matter. Like you may as well not even do it. They don't. It so far as the finance guys are concerned, you could ex, you could blow your plant up in fifty years and they wouldn't care because it's so far in the future. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Now for me, I think the Earth is a long term plan. So you know. But hey, yeah. What do I know? We're, we're uh, dealing with accountants at this point. Right. Um, so high capital costs is one massive drawback, and then the other big drawback is that uh, the public perception is bad. People are afraid of nuclear power because radiation is scary. Um, And I guess a minor drawback would be the spent fuel that you have to deal with. I say it's a minor drawback because it's actually less of a problem than people think it is. So that's more under the public perception thing, but it is a thing you do have to take care of. Yeah, the other other thing I've read about spent fuel is it's turned out some of the experiments, some tests that I've, I don't know whether they would tests as such, but they basically, they found that it's a lot less dangerous than even like some of the experts were expecting. There was it's... a thing I read about it being, I think so. I don't know it was, it got dumped like really deep underwater, like, like at the bottom of the ocean. And they found basically it just doesn't move at all. It just yeah, sits uh, there. And one, right? one natural test of that idea is uh, the Oklo natural nuclear reactor, which occurred billions of years ago. It was a nuclear reactor that happened in nature. And the reason we were able to tell it happened is because all the radioactive isotopes, like the the stuff stayed exactly where it was. We could go see them, you know? Uh, so yeah, as long as the the fuel cladding, the, the metal that like is that rod, as long as that stays intact, then everything's just going to sit there forever. Um, mm-hmm. So the trick to uh, dealing with nuclear with spent fuel long-term is just ensuring that that rod stays together, right? So you don't want to like, Go dump it in your local, you know, aquifer or something. You know, <laughs> contaminate the drinking water or anything like yeah, that. But as long as you're not like an idiot, that. then it's not that hard. And yeah, I'll say it. It is a challenging thing in that you have to spend time and money and deliberately plan. But it is a solved problem from an engineering perspective. Yeah, there's nothing like controversial about it, particularly. No, uh, um, Finland has thing... a great uh, spent fuel facility. Basically, all you have to do is. Uh, uh, Finland, what they did was they have a mine uh, that you can do geological surveys to see how much water gets in the area, and they'll pick an area with very little water infiltration over thousands of years. And they very deep underground. They have a hole. You take your rod, you encase that in metal and concrete, and then that whole thing you encase in clay, put it in a hole, and then backfill the whole thing with clay. And then it, it can just sit there for the next okay. million years. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's been discussions about doing that in some of the old coal mines here. Because mm. we don't really mine coal here anymore. I think we've got loads of coal, but it's like cheaper to buy it from Poland or or something. So, um, but there's loads of very old 
coal mines like back from the industrial revolution which they, i think there has been talk about using those to dump old nuclear waste in so are those the reasons why because most nations don't have much in the way of nuclear france is an exception mm -hmm. they have mostly nuclear but generally Correct. countries i mean the uk has a few but not many and they've been dragging their feet on building more um is that the reason then generally speaking why that's the case i i think the cost is the single biggest reason uh, there's public perception so there's a lot of uh nimby not in my backyard kind of idea uh politicians sometimes are dis are have a dis they're dis disincentivized for like pitching this massive infrastructure project you know because it's unpopular but ultimately if it were more profitable i i like money is what talks right so um i think the the fact that you have to spend a ton of money up front and that's one it's hard to do because you have to convince a lot of people to give you 20 billion dollars but also uh not every place needs you know a massive 20 billion dollar plant you know and so mm -hmm. if if you're a smaller market then you wouldn't build a nuclear plant at least not a traditional nuclear plant yeah it always bugged me during the when all the covid pandemic stuff kicked off there was for years there's been oh we need to build nuclear oh it's too expensive oh we can't do this because it's too expensive and then covid happens the government's oh yeah here's 300 billion <laughs> to, to, to you know to pay people to not work for a year it's like, hang on a second you didn't have any money last year <laughs> i mean the the u.s military budget could easily finance <laughs> nuclearifying the entire grid if they wanted yeah. to <laughs> you know it's it's a matter of political will and that's the, the case not just for nuclear but for green energy in general yeah. cool right uh safety we can talk about safety now sure so one of the things that's come up a lot um so a few years ago we had the fukushima thing nobody cared about the massive tsunami that killed tens of thousands of people everybody cared about the nuclear power plant mm -hmm. having a meltdown which killed nobody um and then obviously everybody's heard of chernobyl or chernobyl however it's pronounced and the other one that i'm familiar with say familiar with as in i've heard of is three mile island mm -hmm. but, so those there are, have been those are the big three the big three yes it's probably why i've why, why uh, i've heard of them um so everybody's aware of these big nuclear meltdowns the fukushima re um the fukushima disaster was basically the reason why germany decided they were going to scrap all of their nuclear power despite despite the fact that germany is about the least earthquake prone yeah. place on earth because they're in the middle of the eurasian plate not many so, tsunamis in germany no they're not they're, not, <laughs> they're certainly not famous for it um so the question with this is how big a deal are these disasters you know how does the nuclear safety record sort of compare to other methods so obviously no no as, as you said already no process is perfect so hydroelectric will have its problems coal will have its problems um how much of it is media hype and people just being scared of something that this is oh, it's radiation uh, uh, kind, kind of thing well people are afraid of things they don't understand and not very many people understand radiation so it's scary uh and that's not to say that radiation is not dangerous or that uh, these disasters are a great thing. I don't want to minimize the deaths that occurred in Chernobyl um, and the economic impact of these other disasters. However, if you're just looking at the actual facts, the impact of these disasters, the impact in deaths, um, for most importantly, is very low compared to other sources of power. So... Running down the list, Three Mile Island that happened in the U.S., that killed nobody. There was no significant re release of radiation to the public. Uh, the plant was destroyed, but there's um, no damage done there. Fukushima killed one person directly. Uh, for okay. indirect, one guy got a lethal dose um, and ended up dying uh, shortly okay. thereafter. Yeah, I didn't know that one. Uh, but indirectly, it's hard to say because a lot of the deaths that'll come from something like Fukushima will come from evacuation. And like, so if you have to like move a bunch of old people, that stress and moving them away from their source of care, that can lead to deaths. However, as you pointed out, uh, the reason Fukushima melted down is because they had a massive earthquake and a tsunami. So which ones are due to that and which ones are due to the nuclear plants, hard mm -hmm. to say. 
So they probably, some non-zero numbers people died from the nuclear plant. I would suspect that most of the people who died would have died whether the plant had melted down or not, right? Um, either way, both of those were massive economic disasters. I mean, you spent billions of dollars on this reactor, now you're not getting money out of it, right? That That's not great, you know? So from an economic standpoint, it's bad. Um, Chernobyl, of course, is the big one. That's the uh, the the worst disaster that has ever happened and I would suspect ever could happen in a nuclear power plant because Chernobyl was run like a back alley meth lab. Uh, it, it's like, it is hard to imagine how they could have done more to cause their power plant to melt down. Just to give you an idea, they didn't have a containment structure. So in a, in a Western plant, you've got your your the metal can where your uh, fission is happening that is inside a concrete structure and that concrete is m multiple feet thick like you you can literally crash a plane into it right and so there's a lot of work that's going in to contain that uh, they basically had the equivalent of a tin shed for their containment structure uh, they had the reason Chernobyl melted down is they were going to do a safety test safety test is great uh, unfortunately for the safety test which was an electric test they uh, had to shut off a bunch of the safety like checks to make it happen to do the test, uh, but they elected to continue running the plant at 100% power with all of these safety checks disabled so they could do the test. And when they did the test, no nuclear engineer was present who could have told them that this was a bad idea. <laughs> and, so, that, and that's just like the tip of the iceberg of the things they did to mess up. It, it's bad. It was very bad. Um, and so that one killed a bunch of people. Uh, again, hard to say exactly how many. Direct deaths were fewer than 100. Indirect deaths, somewhere more than 100. Um, though, uh, little known fact, at least it, it's not like a secret, but most people don't know. I didn't know until I did a paper or like a, like a report in school on Chernobyl. One unit is the one, it, you know, melted down. That's the Chernobyl disaster. Mm -hmm. There were more units at that place. Usually there's multiple units at a, in a reactor site or a plant site. The so other unit two units. Is, sorry, a unit is what exactly? So a unit. So you've got like the the container where the um, fission is happening. That's one unit, right? That like with its containment structure. But there's often more than one of those on okay. site because you get like efficiency by doing more than one in one place, right? You can share yeah. safety stuff and like for instance, um, there a lot of plants. Not every plant has one, but a lot of plants have two or three. At Chernobyl, I believe they had four originally. Uh, the other two that were in operation when the accident happened continued to operate for more than a decade. Like there were people still working at Chernobyl <laughs> in the nineties. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that blew my mind. So it's like, yeah, so I don't know. Uh, but yeah, Chernobyl, very bad. However, uh, even if you include all of those disasters to include Chernobyl, if you include all of the deaths and the worst case scenario of estimates for deaths, the number of deaths per kilowatt hour for nuclear power is less than any other power generation to include solar and wind. Now, you might wonder, how could a solar panel kill anybody? Well, that stuff for your solar panel didn't just, you know, pop out of the ground on its own. It requires mining. And yeah. mining, sometimes people die. And so the more you have to mine, the more deaths you're going to have. Same thing. So most of your deaths from solar and wind are going to come from the mining efforts required to to make the panels to make the turbine to do all that stuff because uranium doesn't require as much mining because the, there's very little fuel compared yeah, to the power you're getting yeah. yeah there's just less mining you have to do therefore you're gonna have less deaths fewer deaths i should say yeah i guess the i guess the other issue with nuclear which would be a, a problem which I pop, maybe is why people are scared of it is that it persists so like for example with with the um ukraine war recently we've had reports of russian soldiers getting cancer because they just showed up in chernobyl and started digging trenches and the ground is all radioactive so they all breathed in the dust yeah and this is so, like decades after right so uh nuclear disasters are kind of they're, they're kind of like i compare them to uh like a car crash versus an airplane crash when an airplane crash is extremely dramatic you know but over, like, over time, fewer airplanes crash, and so it's safer than driving. When a car crash happens, it's not nearly as dramatic, but more of them happen, it's kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. The difference is, in this case, when the airplane crashes, you can't go to where that airplane crashed for like the next thousand years. You know, uh, So <laughs> the way that a radi uh, 
the, the way that it works, you've, you've fissioned your uranium or plutonium or whatever it is, the stuff that's left is still radioactive and will be radioactive for a long time. And that's not a problem if it stays in its rod and you can take care of it. However, if your plant melts down, then it's spewing that radioactive stuff in some area. Three Mile Island, the containment structure stayed intact, so it didn't actually release that. Inside the containment structure would be very radioactive, but nothing got out to the public. In Chernobyl, that's not the case. They had no containment structure worth mentioning, so radioactive material was spewed elsewhere. And that stuff that there's a range of half-lives. So half-lives is how long it takes for half the stuff to go away and turn into something else. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the radioactivity will be front-loaded, so it'll be intensely radioactive for a few days or weeks, um, maybe even a year. Once you get past that, you're into your longer-lived isotopes that'll stick around for thousands of years. The longer the half-life is, the less radioactive it is. So all that is to say that, yes, the area around a, a disaster like Chernobyl uh, will be dangerous to be around, particularly if you're going to start rolling around in the dirt and like digging it up like that would just without a mask or something like I've told my wife that I would happily tour Chernobyl. Like I would bring a dosimeter or something I could check the dose I'm getting and I would wear like filtration equipment because you don't want to breathe it in. That's where the radiation, most of it can be blocked by your clothes. So the, the most types of radiation just wearing your normal clothes would be fine as long as you wash them afterwards. It's if you breathe it into your lungs, there's nothing protecting then yeah. your flesh from it's, the stuff. Right. When we, did, when we did again, I'm going. I'm going back 20 years to this, the time I did this at school. But we talked about the different radiation sources, and we had one. That the, the the teacher just had he had a piece of it in a box. And it's, I think it was I think it was an alpha. Was it an alpha? I think it might be an alpha emitter. And he's like, yeah, as long as you don't get within a couple of feet of it, you'll be perfectly fine. And it's just, it's like, and don't eat it. <laughs> like whatever, you, if you eat well, it, it will kill you. Well, but as long as you. So that, like, eating is probably said. safer than breathing. So your body tends to purge things it eats pretty quickly. Uh, so if I like ground up some uranium and like, as long as your body won't absorb it, the stuff in it would be bad, like the iodine, because your body will metabolize yeah. iodine. Basically, you want you don't want it to stick around for a long time. Mm -hmm. If you like had a uranium medallion and you wore it for a day, it'd be fine. It wouldn't do, I mean, it's, yeah. I wouldn't recommend doing it, but it's not going to do anything. You wear it against your skin every day for a decade. Well, now, you know, there's a problem, you get, right? You, you probably get some nasty burns or right. something. Uh, another thing to remember, though, with radiation is, first of all, it's not contagious. Some people seem to have this idea that, like, you got a dose of radiation, so we should stay away from you because you're radioactive. That's not the case. Radiation doesn't, like, it, it doesn't mm. replicate in that way. Right. Um, also, when an isotope decays, when an atom decays and spews out its radiation, it kicks it um, equally in all directions. And so it's called isotropic is the word for it. It spits out equally mm -hmm. in all directions. And that means if you um, double your distance away from it, you quarter the radiation you get. And so the best shielding you can have for radiation is just distance. Just get away from it. You don't have to get very far yeah. before it's just not a problem. Right. And so uh, something like Chernobyl, the area around it is bad. And there was a radioactive cloud, which was not great. It wasn't like deadly instantly, but it's still not great. But as long as you don't, I don't know, go dig a trench in this area, you're going to be fine. You know? okay. So I, I can't recommend doing earth moving uh, <laughs> activities yeah, at was, Chernobyl. But that but, was a very face palming kind of news report. But again, that's focusing on Chernobyl, which is like the worst conceivable case, really. Uh, if you look at something like Three Mile Island, there was no release of radiation. Uh, yeah. By So I happen to work in probabilistic risk assessment, and one of the things we do is we figure out how likely it is for the core to melt, and then also, if it were to melt, how likely it is that you would release radiation to the environment before people could evacuate. And uh, it's extremely, extremely unlikely to melt down, but even if the core melts, so you've you're the this pellet is melted down and the metal that's around it no longer works, so like it's the containment structure there is gone. Only about ten percent of those cases will release radiation to the environment such that it would kill people. So all that is to say that while there is the potential for a large early release of radiation that could potentially harm people around it. Even if that happened, the number of deaths would not, it's not like 
it's a nuclear explosion. It's not like a, it's a hydrogen bomb going off, right? Uh, it doesn't have that. Yeah. Like, it can't explode. So as long as if you're a distance away from the reactor, it's not going to be a problem at all. And the vast and overwhelming majority of the time, even if it melts down, the only people that are going to be impacted are the people at the plant, the workers. The population is going to be fine. Um, but again, I just have to emphasize, even if you factor in all of those deaths from Chernobyl and the worst case scenario deaths, if you attributed every single death from the tsunami and earthquake to Fukushima, to the nuclear reactor, even then the number of deaths per kilowatt hour would be lower for nuclear than for any other form of energy generation. So if you care about deaths, if you care about protecting human lives, and that's the most important thing to you, then there's nothing better to, to do that than nuclear power. Yeah. So you'd say that the general cultural fear of nuclear power is unjustified. Absolutely. Unequivocally, it is nuclear power is far more dangerous in public imagination than it is in reality. There are dangers, but they can be mitigated. Interesting thing that I um, saw about Chernobyl, the um, BBC does a, does the, um, David Attenborough does the occasional big kind of nature series. Mm hmm. And they had um, a Chernobyl was in one of those because humans don't live there anymore. There's loads of wildlife that's moved back in. Mm -hmm. And it's like there's, there was, you mentioned, I can't remember what they call it, but it's some type of wolf. But it's like the east, the, the westernmost population of wolves have moved back in because it's humans, it's too, humans consider it to be too dangerous to live there. So obviously everybody evacuated. The animals don't know any better. So they've all just moved in, and now it's like it's a really apparently it's a really um, uh, effective nature park now. It's a de facto nature preserve, and yeah. the humans were far more dangerous to the animals than the radiation is. Like I'm yeah. sure that there's an elevated uh, incidence of cancer among those wolves. However, there's a much lower incidence of getting shot in the face. So <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so in order to help rewild the planet, we just need a few more nuclear meltdowns. <laughs> Well, I don't think that would be a great method. There's that's definitely my, some... that's my that's my proposed solution for um, the ecology and carbon, you know, decarbonization. Um, great. So thanks for that. So just to finish off, because we're we're getting towards the end now, um, talking a little bit about the future. So, where do you think nuclear power is going in terms of development, technological development? So I think the most significant development for nuclear power is not the one that gets the most uh, press. So a lot of people, particularly your nuclear fanboys, the people who are all excited about nuclear power, they tend to focus on the Gen 4 reactor designs, the really sexy, like your liquid metal fast reader reactors or molten salt and stuff like that. And those are very cool. But I think far more significant for actually generating power is making nuclear power smaller. So I told you one of the biggest drawbacks is that huge capital cost. Well, part of that is because the nuclear power plants are massive. Well, if they're not so massive, they don't cost so much, right? And so there's a push in the nuclear industry to develop what are called small modular reactors. They're reactors that are small. So for usually somewhere in the neighborhood of like 100 megawatts versus 1,000 megawatts of power. They are modular. Because they're small, they can often be built like in a factory somewhere else mm -hmm. and then ship to the site so you could build many of them in series and then you would that would tend to lower the cost um, and they are um, they can also be used in different situations so for example you can't just put a thousand megawatt reactor anywhere it takes up a lot of space it, less footprint than other forms of power generation but still it requires space one of the ways you could use a small modular reactor because it is so small is you could take a coal plant that you don't want to use anymore get rid of the coal part drop a nuclear reactor there, and it's already got all the electrical switchyard and everything you need, and because its footprint is very small, you can run it with sometimes as few as a dozen people can run this power plant. Um, and so for a place that doesn't require that massive uh, investment in infrastructure, doesn't have the market to justify it, they can build this SMR, and they can even add to it later. So as population grows, as need grows, you can just add another reactor. Right. You just put another one in, yeah. Right. So an example of this actually happening, the first SMR to ever go online um, commercially was recently done in China. They uh, put on the high temperature gas cooled reactor pebble bed module. So it's very cool design, uses gas instead of um, water for its working fluid, producing about 200 megawatts electric. And so I think that that is the future of nuclear power 
generation. I don't know if America is going to succeed in making that happen. There are a lot of efforts underway in America to make it happen, but I think it's going to happen somewhere. Yeah. China is currently leading the way. And there's quite a lot of um, work going on in the UK as well, because we find them in the news over here every so often. Mm -hmm. I th from what I gather, they, at least in the UK, because it's being pushed, it's Rolls Royce in the UK that are doing it, or they're one of the main, the main partners in it. A lot of it is development of the kinds of reactors that they put in nuclear submarines. Hmm. So it was kind of well, we can already build small reactors because we build. You know, we don't have nuclear. Obviously, in the UK, we don't have nuclear aircraft carriers, but we have nuclear submarines. So they're taking. I think they're taking a sort of a design based on that and putting it in a building, effectively. Or you could do that uh, if you did it exactly like. Sorry, Karen. If you did it exactly like a sub, you wouldn't have to refuel it for like every like what once every yeah. twenty years or something crazy like that. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of different competing designs for small modular reactors. Some things they have in common are well, they're small, uh, but also they tend to be because they're new designs. They're passively safe. So a lot of the designs that are currently operating are designs that were made, conceived in the fifties and sixties, and built in the seventies mm -hmm. or eighties, right? And we've progressed a lot in technology since then, and so. You can have reactors that don't have the same vulnerabilities that an uh, old reactor does. Part of the reason you have an issue with an old reactor is that after you shut the reactor down, you have to continue cooling it because that, radi that radioactive decay, the fission has stopped, but the mm -hmm. radioactive decay is still happening. You can't stop it. That's just physics. Yeah. So about 5% of your total heat is that decay heat, and that's enough to melt the core in an old uh, design. And you have, to, so you have to have electricity supplied to the plant in order to keep that happening. And if your safety structures fail, fail and they're active safety structures, pumps and things like that, then you can't remove the K-heat and your plant fails. That's what happened in Fukushima. In a more modern design, they are often passively safe. So, for example, uh, in, a, in a molten salt reactor, which is a reactor where the fuel is like distributed through this molten salt, this, this liquid, um, and it can only do fission in the reactor because the geometry is such that if you if it's in a different area, there's not enough of it in one area to do fission, basically. Um, they have a plug at the bottom of that same molten salt that is constantly cooled to keep it frozen. Well, if you're pa you lose power, then that will no longer be cooled. The plug will melt and your core dumps into a tank where it can be where it's safe. So if you lose yeah. power, it will passively take care of itself and you can't melt. It would be disastrous to the plant, <laughs> but it wouldn't be a disaster to human beings right yeah. and that's, that's one we, example of a passive fail to safe yeah exactly so um, it's a bit like how i've read I, it might be in older designs where they use graphite rods and the graphite rods are suspended electromagnetically mm -hmm. so then if the power fails the rods just fall into the reactor and just shut it down yeah your control rods in even in an older designs like an old pressurized water reactor design the control rods the one that'll stop the reaction there held up above the core yeah. and so if that if it fails then the idea is they will drop through just gravity alone into the yeah. uh the core the kind of thing yeah great so that pretty much concludes all of the stuff um one final question is how do you what are your thoughts about nuclear fusion so fusion for anyone who isn't familiar is what the star our sun is powered by fission is something splitting apart Fusion is mashing things together. And so if you mash light elements together, elements lighter than iron, you get energy out. You get a lot of energy out. And it doesn't come with a bunch of radioactive stuff on the outside, right? So it's great. You get power and you don't have all the waste to deal with. It's awesome. And you can use hydrogen, and hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, right? So all wins all around. Uh, unfortunately, it's really hard to do when you're not a star. And uh, so there's active research constantly going on. Uh, we have a, a saying in the nuclear industry that fusion power is just 20 years away and always will be. 20 <laughs> years from now, it will still be 20 years away. That's just the way it is. I have no idea if or when fusion power will actually be commercialized. If it were invented today, if like they actually solved it and like they figured out how to do fusion in such a way that it was economical, we can do fusion, but like we can't do it in a way that you get more power out than you put in. Yeah. Um, if they did it today we wouldn't have the first commercial fusion plant for 20 years. And so, like, it's great. We should do research into it. We should continue to invest in this future technology. However, 
We shouldn't be relying on fusion to solve our problems. We have the technology we need to solve our problems right now with a mix of solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, geothermal, et cetera. We have the technology today to solve all of the world's electrical problems. The only thing we are lacking is the will to do it. <laughs> so. Ooh. Yeah, so I'm not going to be holding my breath for nuclear fusion reactors. Don't. It would be neat, yeah. but I would be shocked if we had the first commercial fusion reactor before I'm dead. Yeah. And just, just, as, a, just as a quick clarification for people wondering what Jordan meant when he said it takes more energy to you put in more energy than you get out. That's because you, it only works if you heat it to like a million degrees or something ridiculous like that. So you, a huge amount of energy has to go into starting the reaction. And then the reaction doesn't produce enough energy to pay for itself. Basically, you have to... Atoms don't want to combine. Nuclei, nuclei do not want to go together because there's protons like charges. And so they really don't want to be close, right? And so you have to force them close. The star gets away with it because gravity is doing the work for it. There's just a lot of it there. So it's compressive. Gravity can overcome that, that force and, and cause it to happen. We don't have, we can't make a star yeah. on earth. And so we have to shove the stuff together using some thing. Most designs are a laser of some sort, but it doesn't have to be, but something, something is putting energy into this thing to mash all yeah. the atoms together such that they'll fuse. And that something requires mm. energy and currently requires more energy than you get to the thing. Great. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for that. Um, that was a very good explanation of everything. I certainly learned quite a lot from that. I had a bit of it clarified. It confirmed a lot of things I, I kind of knew, but kind of didn't and mm. clarified and explained a lot of extra things. So hopefully everybody who's watching this has, has learned something from that. Thank you very much for your time and coming in. And if anybody has any further questions, leave them in the comments and then I will send them to Jordan and you might get around to answering them at some point if they're related to clear power i'll almost definitely if, answer if, them. They're, if they're relevant <laughs> and interesting yeah anyway thank you very much 